Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Meyer, and I am the Interim Executive Director of the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, or CIRL, at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. On behalf of the Center, I would like to welcome you to the first in our series of book talks the academic year. CIRL is a nonpartisan interdisciplinary institute dedicated to preserving and promoting the rule of law in 21st century national security, warfare, and democratic governance. We draw from the study of law, philosophy, and ethics to answer the difficult questions that arise in contemporary transnational conflicts, as well as intrastate challenges to democratic principles. To submit a question for today's talk, please use the Q&A function or feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of the window. Please keep your questions topical and appropriate. Anyone posting inappropriate language or content will be removed. If you are seeking CLE credit for today's event, please note that CLA codes will be presented twice per hour. Therefore, there will be three CLE codes. Write down these codes and enter them on your digital evaluation form once the chat is over. You should have the form already, but if you need another copy of the link, it will be posted in the chat. The evaluation form is mandatory to receive CLE credits. These codes will tell us how long you attended. The first pass code is September. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's talk, Professor Claire Finkelstein. Claire is the Algernon Biddle Professor of Law and Professor of Philosophy at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as the Academic Director of Searle. Claire? Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, and uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I am delighted to introduce our speakers for today's talk <clears throat> on a topic uh, that has at least a little bit of relevance and is very much on, on everybody's mind these days. Uh, Tom Ginsburg and Aziz Hook uh, have written an absolutely marvelous book called How to Save a Constitutional Democracy. Uh, the link to the book is available and you can uh, purchase it. I very much uh, encourage you to do so. It is a fascinating read and uh, even more relevant uh, than when the book uh, was published because day by day uh, there were developments that may concern us that we are losing our grasp on our democracy. So let me first introduce our authors. Tom Ginsburg is the Leo Spitz Professor of International Law, uh, the Ludwig and Hilda Wolf Research Scholar, and a Professor of Political Science at the University of Chicago. He holds BA, JD, and PhD degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. His latest book is this one, How to Save a Constitutional Democracy, and earlier books included Judicial Review in New Democracies, which was published in 2003. Uh, he won the Herman Pritchett Award from the American Political Science Association uh, for the Endurance of National Constitutions, which also won a Be Best Book Prize from the APSA. He's also written something called Judicial Reputation, which was published in 2015. He currently co-directs the Comparative Constitutions Project, which is an effort funded by the National Science Foundation to gather and analyze the constitutions of all independent nation states since 1789. Finally, he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Aziz Hook is the Frank and Bernice Greenberg Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. His teaching and, and research interests include constitutional law, criminal procedure, federal courts, and legislation. His scholarship concerns the interaction of constitutional design with individual rights and liberties. His pieces have garnered the ALS Junior Scholars Paper Competition Award in Criminal Law, and he's been selected for the Harvard Stanford Yale Junior Faculty Forum. Before joining the law school faculty, who worked as associate counsel and then director of the Liberty and National Security Project of the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU School of Law. Thank you so much for joining us, both of you, uh, Aziz and Tom. Thanks so much for having us. And Aziz, I think you'll need to unmute. Thank Brother, you. Thank you for having us. Wonderful. 
So uh, we have a lot to talk about today. Uh, this book is really extraordinary in so many different ways. Uh, as I read uh, each new chapter, so many new examples came to mind of the many things that you're talking about. And, and the big question that you raise and in part answer is whether or not we are in the process of a, an erosion of our constitutional democracy. And I'm gonna focus a lot of our discussion on the US, but you have extraordinary examples from around the world uh, that allow us to really compare what we're currently undergoing in the US to the experiences of other countries in, in recent years in particular. Uh, so we're gonna look at those as well uh, I just want to start by asking you, so the two of you first met, I gather, when you were both working in Afghanistan. And uh, I wonder how much of that experience colored your thinking and sort of set you up for the work that you did uh, in this book and in previous articles in the run-up to the book. Um, Tom, why don't I uh, ask you to, to tell for us a little bit what you were doing in Afghanistan, and then Aziz, I'll ask you the same question. Yeah, terrific. I was, uh, I'd done a lot of work over the years in uh, consulting with governments and aid, um, uh, development agencies around issues of judicial independence and constitution making and such. And in Afghanistan, this was before the constitution was written. So after the American invasion, but before the system was really set up, I was brought over by the United Nations and uh, the USAID to kind of help think through how one would establish an independent judiciary in a country which had been ruled by you know, by the Taliban for so long. Uh, so that was my, my story, what I was doing there. Right, and Aziz. I, I was working for a not-for-profit think tank called the International Crisis Group that looks at the causes of violent conflict and primarily uh, focused upon the process that, uh, Af that the Afghan uh, state, uh, but probably more importantly, the international community was engaged in uh, to build a new constitution. Uh, which is really uh, entangled with the project of building a new democracy. So you're both really interested in the project of constitution building. Yeah, I guess uh, one, yeah. one experience that came, you know, one reason we've done all this work overseas is we um, realize and learn that constitutional democracy is a very, very precious thing, it's very hard to establish. And, you know, I guess I'd say that, you know, from all that experience, we thought, um, you know, one of our big points of the book is that American exceptionalism is not really a very valid way of approaching these things. As um, odd as our country is, we thought we could learn something from the dynamics in the rest of the world. And certainly um, the idea that constitutional democracy is really worth defending is something we've learned from that experience because it is precious. So we're going to talk today about how we defend it. And, and first we'll do the, um, the deconstructing part, which is what's happening to our democracy and are we in the process of a kind of dissolution. Um, you talk about uh, using as your touchstone the idea of a liberal constitutional democracy. Uh, because of course, before we can say whether or not our, our democracy is in the process of dissolution, we have to be able to know what democracy is. Uh, so what is the concept, maybe Tom, I'll start with you, uh, of a liberal constitutional democracy and what are its components? Sure. Uh, by, according to democracy is what they call an essentially contested concept. There's lots of debate, indeed whole subfields of political science trying to define democracy. And by one account, um, it's, a, it's a concept with over 500 adjectives that have been attached to it. Um, our main point in using that construct was to recognize that democracy is more than elections, right? As lawyers and uh, law professors, we recognize that, you know, elections are one thing. That's a very thin definition of democracy, but you can't really have elections unless you have certain liberal rights, which are really closely tied to those, the right to vote, the right to free speech, the right to free association, a small number of other rights that we think are essential to make democracy work. Uh, and then I guess the third component, which we uh, put in here, is the idea of what we call the bureaucratic rule of law. And if you think about it, you can't really have an election unless you have bureaucrats who are willing to count those votes in a neutral and fair way according to the prior rules. Uh, and it's not a part of most definitions, but together that's what we think of as liberal constitutional democracy. And it's more important than just mere electoral democracy where the majority uh, can do what it wants without those protecting those key rights and institutions. 
So free elections, uh, civil liberties and civil rights, and the rule of law, in effect. If essential. Is, is your components, right. So, uh, so now let's talk about how democracies start to erode or collapse. In fact, you have uh, the book lays out two roads to the destruction of democracy. One, a kind of sudden collapse, and the other, an erosion, a slow erosion of democracy. Aziz, maybe you want to take us through that and explain to us what are the, um, what's the difference between those two modes? Sure. I, I think that when I came to this topic and when I think many people come to the uh, to think about how democracy uh, ends, they have a quite particular image in mind. Uh, and that, that image often comes from the terrible experience of the 20th century uh, in Europe, and in particular, the fall of the Weimar Republic uh, and the rise of the, uh, the Nazi regime at the beginning of the 1930s. Um, and one of the key moves in the consolidation of power and the termination of democratic rule uh, in the early 1930s in Germany was the use of uh, an emergency, the burning of the Reichstag fire, excuse me, the burning of the Reichstag, which is the parliamentary building in Berlin, as a platform for uh, installing emergency rule and extinguishing the uh, civil uh, and political liberties and often the, li the, the lives uh, and freedoms of many opposition politicians. So we have an image of the failure of democracy as a sudden, crisp, certain event. Uh, the other way in which we, we think about uh, the, the, the end of democracy is, is in terms of a military coup. What we and others find, however, when we look at data about the quality of democracy around the world over time is that the frequency of sudden collapses of democracy went down dramatically in the 1970s. It's not to say that we don't see coups happening. Uh, we certainly do. There was one uh, quite recently in Mali, uh, but their frequency has gone down dramatically. Instead, what we see in the data is many more jurisdictions, many more countries, where the quality of democracy, as measured by a number of different uh, 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 instruments for uh, evaluating civil liberties, free speech, the quality of elections, etc., right? Uh, the quality of democracy is declining incrementally. We suggest that over time, the modality, the pathway for democratic decline has changed from fast to slow, right? And we provide some reasons why that might be. But we say that if you, we, we, if you care about democracy, what you should be worried about is primarily not the extraordinary use of emergency or military powers. Rather, you should be concerned with slow, erosive processes. And one of the key points that we make in the book is that in these slow, erosive processes of democratic backsliding, the instruments that are used to unpick democracy from within are instruments that are created. They're, they're an arsenal that is found within democracy and constitutions themselves. Let's Let's go back just before we talk about the erosion uh, method, and let's talk about the, the fast collapse <laughs> method first. Um, and, and back on the Reichstag fire, because right, this is the um, image that we all have in our minds. And, and there's some interesting parallels uh, with today. Um, so you know, what we think is that the Reichstag fire was of course not what the Nazis claimed it was. It was not set by, uh, you know, by a, a communist agitator, um, but rather the Nazis probably set it themselves as an excuse for uh, coming in and, and in effect declaring martial law. Um, so, 
you know, why, why is, and one of the interesting things just historically that you have in the book is a little bit of um, historical uh, or historiography on what most people think about how to understand that event. Uh, you say it's not really Article 48 of the Weimar Constitution that was the danger, um, you know, the article that allowed um, for the declaration of an emergency, um, but it's really the, um, what was done to construct the authoritarian governments in the wake. Can you talk a little bit about that, Tom? Sure. I mean, I think the, the main point is, uh, you know, analysts focus on this particular article of the Constitution, and I'll say a little more, more about the relevance of it to the United, to the United States. Uh, but the key thing which allowed that regime to take over was actually a political faction, factor, which was the uh, conservative party essentially fearing the left so much that they aligned with the Nazis, and then that was the end of everything. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we don't believe that the United States is, susceptible, is likely to have that kind of sudden collapse. First of all, our constitution being really old doesn't even have a clause about declaring a constitutional state of emergency. It's true we have hundreds of statutes which have different uses of the term emergency, but none that allow the suspension you know, of, of the legislative process or anything like that. So we don't see democracy ending in the United States with that kind of declaration of emergency. We don't really see a military coup uh, and frankly, we don't see a communist revolution, notwithstanding a lot of heated rhetoric at the moment. Uh, instead, we think that it's going to be that slower constitutional process. And so uh, the Weimar situation is illustrative of a particular danger, but it's not the one that we face. Right. So if we uh, look at, you know, at the use of the concept of emergency in our system, and we know that Donald Trump has declared a, uh, what many of us believe is a, a faux emergency on the border, um, the claim that we need to protect ourselves from uh, marauding um, South and Latin Americans and Mexicans who are going to come into our country and, and commit a lot of crime and so on. Um, and so he has played on these um, racial fears and fears of immigration, which of course reminds us also of Germany in the in the 1920s and 30s. Um, you know, why is that? Why are we in a different position? Why is the risk of emergency, or if you uh, might think about the possibility that uh, he could declare an emergency with regard to the election, if we cannot, uh, if the results of the election are not in soon enough, if we are in a state of uncertainty. Uh, Bart Gelman has an incredibly interesting piece out about, uh, which you may, may or may not have seen um, just uh, yesterday, I believe, about um, how the real danger is that we will be in a state of confusion following the election and that that might be right for, um, you know, for Donald Trump to, to really control the process and control the levers of power that will allow us to sort out who, in fact, won the election. Right. Uh, do you want to? Well, go go ahead, Tom. Why don't you Why don't you um, follow up on that, and then I'll go back to Aziz with. Yeah, well, just very quickly. Um, you know, again, there's no national. You know, one of the interesting things about the dynamics of uh, the last few months is that there's often declarations from the White House about you know we're going to come in, we're going to do this. So that powers that are fundamentally lacking. But uh, the point you make about electoral confusion is almost certain to occur. And that's because, of course, we're holding an election with many states having created last minute, uh, you know, mail in ballot systems, which generally take like a year to set up. Uh, and um, so and also, of course, just yeah, calling into question the validity of those kind of um, electoral systems. It's going to be very messy. And it could be that the result is not known, even in the best of circumstances, for several weeks. And so that makes it ripe for a lot of confusion, as you put it. Right, right. So, so in a sense, you know, couldn't we possibly be looking at a, a kind of sudden collapse scenario, um, not so different from what happened in Germany in the 1930s? I, I think we, we saw something akin to what happened in Germany in the 1930s, it, recently in, in Hungary, where Viktor Orban has uh, relied upon the fact of the pandemic to assert or, or to uh, cajole his uh, allied Fidesz parliament 
into handing over a large amount of decree power. Um, I, I think that that's um, unlikely to happen um, in the United States because we, we don't have a framework for that kind of uh, mass delegation of the sort that we saw both in Hungary and then uh, in the 1930s in Germany in the form of what's called the Enabling Act. Right? The Enabling Act suspended the parliament and uh, led to the continuity of, of Nazi rule up until 1945, uh, I think, when there was a, a fresh elections. Um, the, the risk here, though, doesn't, I, I think that the risk that you're referring to, Claire, is not one that necessarily flows through a particular constitutional or statutory emergency power, right? The risk here is that the president has general authority, has two kinds of authority that are, are, are relevant, I think, in your hypothetical. One is the authority over coercive forces, right? Particularly the National Guard. And we've seen around the BLM protests and in particular in the Lafayette Square uh, uh, event, how uh, military uh, forces that are domestically based might be employed in ways that are antithetical to the uh, democratic process. And, and well, yeah. and Aziz, right, and add to that, just jump in for a minute here, um, that we don't know where these right wing agitators are coming from who are helping to turn what, what might very well be uh, peaceful protests. Uh, sure. in many cases into violent protests that smacks an awful lot of the Reichstag fire. Sure, but I, I, would, I would draw attention to a, to a second mechanism of authority that the president has that's quite distinctive to the US uh, context. And this builds upon Tom's point about the federalization uh, or in the sense of decentralization, sorry, the decentralization of electoral administration to the states, that's very rare, right? It doesn't happen in any other a uh, large federal democracy, right? And uh, the role of partisan elected secretaries of state, this is one of the uh, uh, claims that we make in the book about the weaknesses of American democracy, right? The role of partisan secretaries of state in managing the elections and the role that state legislatures and governors have in certifying slates of electors for the purpose of the electoral right. college. The president's leeway is probably more importantly understood in terms of the partisan uh, filaments that run from the White House to these state level partisan actors, right? That's the uh, instrument that I think is uh, probably going to be most salient in November rather than the exercise of brute force. Right. So uh, just to finish on the emergencies and then we'll get to the, the erosion, which is what you're really pointing to. Um, you know, what we have is the 1976 Emergencies Act. And it's interesting because that act was really designed to try to limit the uh, president's power over emergencies since we had all these emergencies declared, they never sunsetted. Uh, you talk about that as, as well in your book about the, the danger of emergencies that just hang around. Um, the irony is, however, that, that Congress didn't see fit to define what counts as an emergency in that act. And so the problem is that it's really sort of up to at least it looks like it's up to the occupants of, of, of the Oval Office to say what counts as a, uh, an emergency. Um, you know, Tom, just back to you on that. So what do you think the um, you know, the risk is from the open-ended nature of that act and what should be done to deal with that. Right, and I'll just first note that it is rather exceptional. So I've been doing a paper on uh, responses to COVID around the world and yeah. most other constitutions have very clear, you know, limitation, a definition of what an emergency is, a natural disaster, uh, invasion, et cetera. So that vagueness is of course a danger, which means that, um, you know, it would end up presumably being litigated before the Supreme Court, which has been extraordinarily deferential uh, on issues of executive power. It's sort of a critical tenet of uh, current um, federalist society a dogma, if I might say, that, you know, the president has authority in certain areas, especially foreign affairs, but presumably here, um, they would also be quite deferential. So there is potential for abuse. I don't want to... Uh, and, and of course, we're down to justice, <laughs> <laughs> which... Uh, 
maybe maybe very difficult. And I should have said right off the bat that um, Aziz, you actually clerked for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, and, and so I'm sure you feel uh, the loss um, right at this moment more keenly, um, particularly keenly as you think about the guardrails on our constitutional democracy. Let's talk about the erosion then. What you really believe uh, it sounds like is that the greatest danger to the US in terms of uh, losing our democracy is a slow, corrosive process and something that, that you seem to feel has been going on for a little while already. Um, what does that, what does the slow corrosion look like? Uh, where does it come from? Uh, Aziz? It, to go back to your first question, Claire, about the definition of liberal constitutional democracy. Notice that the three elements that we picked out are institutions. They're uh, the way that elections are administered, the, the fact that law enforcement is a, used as an implement of uh, one partisan force, the availability of some kind of a remedy if your speech or efforts at association are stifled. Um, because the predicates, the uh, building blocks of a democracy are institutional in character, and because those institutions are embedded in the Constitution, either directly or indirectly, it turns out that there are many ways of using powers granted within a Constitution to render those institutional predicates of democracy inefficacious. So this doesn't mean getting rid entirely of elections. It doesn't mean uh, getting rid entirely of opposition figures uh, or mobilization that is antithetical or resistant to the uh, hegemonic political party. What it does mean is altering the legal landscape, often in small pieces, and incrementally building on those up those pieces over time uh, in ways that make functional electoral competition impossible. Uh, and we, we describe how this has occurred along, uh, in the book, we offer a kind of five-part typology. Uh, we have learned that we should never, ever uh, actually offer a five-part typology in public. That's like four parts. <laughs> Uh, but the, the, the point to take away is uh, the sheer numerosity of ways in which elements of constitutional power can be turned against the democratic constitutional project, even if they were embedded in a constitution in good right. faith as, uh, as elements of that project to begin with. Right. Um... And so, uh, you know, one thing that you really, uh, reading I felt absolute uh, chills up and down my spine is your discussion about char uh, charismatic populism. The idea of a charismatic leader who appeals directly to the people, for example, with a Twitter account, uh, doesn't have to pass through the institutions as much as other leaders have, finds a way to connect directly with the people. What are the dangers of uh, charismatic populism and how does that play into the turn towards autocracy, Tom? Yeah, so uh, there's been a lot of literature on populism recently and there's certain features I think that we see in a lot of definitions. And one is first of all, the idea of the people, right? That it is a single unified uh, entity um, and if you're not in, then you're an enemy of the people. So it's a really a bright line definition of who's in and who's out. And the other, and this is where the charismatic element comes in, is a leader who claims the unique ability to uh, intuit what the people want and to speak for the people. And we've seen the rise of these leaders all over the world, and some of them have taken over their political systems. And for various reasons, they're arising in many countries at the same time. The real danger is that a leader who claims the, a direct connection with the people um, has every, inst every incentive to erode every institution in society, which is between the people and the leaders. So attacks on civil society, we see that. We see uh, efforts to undermine neutral bureaucracies. We see efforts to um, call into question courts and you know, legal institutions. 
everything is defined by are you on the side of me and the people or are you an enemy of the people? And so it's right. Really so what, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just, I'd be, I'd, I'm finished. I was just saying it's yeah. a gross process. Erosion. So, so what, what you're really saying and what I think um, the book is so um, brilliant at conveying is when we think about the rule of law, uh, which here at the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law, we do quite a bit. Um, we think about institutions and we think about the institutions as the guardrails on our democracy. And when you have a charismatic populist leader who bypasses those institutions, uh, it's very dangerous uh, and very difficult to maintain those guardrails. So let's talk more specifically about what those institutions are uh, that would normally provide the guardrails on uh, against and a, and a hedge against this kind of slow erosion of democracy. Let's look at, um, for example, the, the Congress. Um, you know, what do we see in terms of the ability of our congressional leaders to, uh, to provide a hedge against the disintegration of democracy? You know, are they doing their job? And if not, why not? Tom, I'll go back to you for a minute and then I'll, I'll come back to Aziz. Sure. So, you know, obviously the courts are a major institution. And when we look around the world, we see uh, these checks and balances, you know, courts and legislatures. Uh, the pattern is that you pack the courts and you bypass the legislature. And so, you know, direct exercises of executive action, a uh, very common thing that we observe. Um, and, you know, is Congress uh, stepping up to the plate? Well, I think that's disputed. But certainly, um, you know, they've, so, so, since the 2018 election, We've seen efforts, certainly, to, um, to constrain the president. Uh, one problem with the way things are developing is that the legitimacy of both branches seems to be in decline. Um, so we saw a real decline in people's perception of the rule of law after the impeachment um, uh, proceedings, um, a sense that Congress is ever falling, low, falling ever lower in terms of its public assessment. The courts are somewhat better, but also declining. And so that's a real corrosion and erosive process that we see just from the fighting. Yeah, and so Aziz, it's interesting because uh, one of the most fascinating things about the book, I think, is your discussion of executive authority and the expansion of executive authority over time. Um, and one of the things that we see is um, in this kind of charismatic populism are elected officials lining up behind the, uh, charismatic, popular leader um, and, and behaving less like institutionalists and more like populists themselves. Um, can you comment on that in our, in our current sure. situation? I think it's useful to think about um, uh, the executive and the legislature separately to, to get a grip on your question. Mm -hmm. On the legislative side, it's worth recalling that the framers viewed the legislature as the principal source of tyranny risk. It's a famous line in the Federalist Papers about the legislative vortex that sucks everything in, that framers were sort of, uh, uh, as we all are, captured by the risks that they saw unfolding at the moment that they were doing their work. And, and the risk at that point in time were these populist state legislatures that were passing shock horror, redistributive taxes, right, uh, uh, to, to, to alleviate uh, uh, war debt. Um, and as a consequence of that perception, they structured a legislature with many veto points, a legislature that had, by design, great difficulty in acting as a unified whole. There are, there are few, uh, it, there are actually no uh, elements of the Article I design that fuse together the interests of the institution of, the, of Congress as Congress. So, start off with the observation that Congress, although it is supposed to act in Congress's interests in the separation of power system, isn't actually set up to do that. Right. Layer onto that a more recent development. The more recent development is since the 1970s, as, as many of us know, the emergence of a very, very deep partisan polarization, right? This is uh, the, the two parties uh, used to be characterized by overlapping preferences within the legislature. Uh, they have moved farther apart. 
and any kind of overlap between them has vanished, right? They've become more distant. A consequence of partisan polarization within a, uh, a, syst a legislative system characterized by veto gates is inaction. It's uh, gridlock. You can't get anything done uh, uh, because there are so many pieces or places where one side or the other can block, right? So we're in a, a, a moment where the constitutional design is in, is interacting with our uh, background set of political preferences, at least as they're represented in Congress, in ways that render Congress highly uh, vulnerable and right. incapable of acting, right? And I'd add to that one, one small point, which is that other constitutions recognize this risk and install what we call minority rights in the constitution. So for example, in the German system, a certain number of committee chairs go to the party that's in opposition, the minority party. And what that does is it ensures that oversight of the executive is continuous. It doesn't ebb and flow as we move from divided to unified government. We don't have anything like that, right? And, and a result of that is oversight is, 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 is increasingly uh, uh, polarized. Well, that's really fascinating, especially because when you compare that to the fact that we are the you know, democracy perhaps with the strongest two-party system, as opposed to having a multiplicity of parties as we see in most uh, advanced uh, European democracies. Um, the question whether or not that plays into it. But, but before we talk about that, let's, can we go back to the executive branch side um, and talk about what, what does appear to be a sort of steady expansion in executive authority, um, in particular, an expansion in uh, presidential authority. And yeah, yeah. So I'll stick with you. you, you or, yeah, go or, ahead. Why don't you go ahead? Uh, so I think that there are three trends that people should keep in mind in thinking about this. Um, the first trend is uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the, the, the executive branch was very small, right? There was like a few customs agents, there was no FBI, there was, there was just not much there. Today, uh, you know, the Border Patrol uh, has 20,000 uh, men and women under arms. Uh, the FBI is similarly, I think, something like 37,000 people. Um, that's an enormous secular trend, or, or an enormously important secular trend that's happened in the, in the last 100, 120 years. That's the first point. The second uh, uh, development is in part because of congressional gridlock, the executive branch has over time become more and more willing to take policy initiatives, both in the ordinary domestic policy domain, but also in the, in the, in the geopolitical uh, foreign affairs domain, and, and, and quite generally, right? And this, this is not a uh, Republican or a Democratic point, it's something that's happened uh, across both, uh, uh, both kinds of administrations. So, so you, what you're really talking about is the rise of the modern administrative state. Well, hold on. Let me, let me add one more, <laughs> to that, which is uh, the emergence since the 1980s of a theory of constitutional power mm. that starts off as a theory about control and about when and how the president can remove particular officials, but over time becomes a much more expansive theory of the scope of presidential power. I think if you put those three things together, you have an institutional landscape that is pregnant with possibilities for the charismatic populist. Yeah, I mean, if we look at what happened on 9-11, for example, and you do identify in the book this as a, um, you know, a turning point of sorts and, and some that had the potential at least to be more of the, the, the shock sure. Uh, emergency factor um, that we were talking about earlier, Tom. Um, how do you see presidential power in this country evolving post 9-11? And, and I think that's something that your experience in Afghanistan might have particularly given you a, um, a purchase on. Yes, of course, you know, the declaration, open-ended declarations of emergency power, as you referred to before, and of uh, expansive ability to use military force were definitely exploited. What's interesting to look at the COVID uh, response, though, is how important other institutions have been, both in our country and abroad. 
uh, which, you know, including legislatures, subnational governments have played a key role. Um, and so it's very interesting. I think that there is this kind of ebb and flow, but I want to pick up on something that Aziz said, um, and since there's uh, it's a CLE program, to make a prediction for you, which is assuming, assuming that the uh, Republicans, um, you know, push through a, a Supreme Court justice in the next few weeks, um, I predict one of the first cases to uh, uh, be overturned will be the 1988 case of Morrison v. Olson, which was about the independent counsel statute in which Justice Scalia had a famous dissent, which is the sort of Ur moment, the source of this theory, which Aziz was talking about, the unitary executive theory. And when I'm on panels uh, with folks, uh, you know, who follow that theory, you know, they act as if it's already been overturned. What that will allow the president to do is to direct prosecutions directly. Uh, to order prosecution of his political enemies. And, you know, that I think is really um, quite a scary thing uh, that I see. Well, coming. in fact, Tom, we already see that, right? Because the Durham investigation, the investigations that are going on through the, um, through the Justice Department already look very much like this kind of, you know, investigation of, of political opponents. Right, in which case the whole constitutional order depends on uh, courts filtering out the valid and the invalid prosecutions. And of course, we've seen uh, obviously a massive effort to, uh, to pack the courts. The courts, rather than being the neutral referee calling balls and strikes, are in fact now a uh, object to partisan contestation. We are fighting presidential elections over who's going to be on the court. It's a crazy way to run a democracy and not uh, the sign of a healthy one. And, and is it to your mind, uh, Tom, um, striking, uh, especially in light of what Aziz was saying, that what we have is a, a, an unusual alignment between the occupant of the Oval Office and members of Congress, the majority party in the Senate in particular, um, where the alliances seem, you know, it's not each branch protecting their own turf against the others, which is the vision that the framers had for our guardrails, but it's in fact a complete realliance yeah. of how you think about the distribution of power in the federal government. Right. I mean, when we look around the world, there's sort of, you mentioned charismatic populism, which is something we certainly have in the United States, but there's another mechanism, another uh, way that democracy, another force that pushes for democratic erosion. That's what we call partisan degradation. Right. When a party decides that, you know, it doesn't really have that much to gain from continued electoral competition and sort of tries to escalate and maybe take over all the institutions. And we observe that around the world. Uh, and so that's how I see what we have in the United States. We're at risk of both of those things at the same time. Um, and the alliance of which you spoke is precisely that. It's a sense that, uh, you know, the traditional, um, there's, a, there's an alliance between, you know, the president and his particular interests and then various parts of the Republican Party, which um, you may not particularly like him or like his style, but see um, a kind of alliance to push an agenda. Right. right. So let's talk now about another guardrail. Uh, which is federalism, as these you started mentioning this before. That's been especially interesting uh, in the politics surrounding the pandemic. Um, so we, we saw something that we really haven't seen for many years, which is this kind of out and out showdown between state governments, particular state governors, and the President of the United States. I mean, this harkens back to, you know, the 19, 1960s. Uh, and Little Rock, when we think about, you know, federal marshals escorting African American school children uh, in the face of furious governors who were trying to keep, uh, you know, keep schools from integrating, except as kind of a reversal, you know, of, of those days in which uh, the federal government was there defending individual rights backed up by a very important Supreme Court decision. Um, and now we have the, you know, a president who is attacking the independence of the governors to try to protect individuals in their states. I mean, how do you see those dynamics playing out with regard to the guardrail issue? So we looked at whether federalism is correlated to risks of democratic decline. And at least at the global level, we don't find a connection. So I think it is premature to say as a general matter that federalism either hinders or helps along processes of democratic backsliding. 
Um, in the United States, I, I, I think it's worth remembering that from the very inception of the Constitution, it was intended that there be an adverse relationship between the states and the federal government. Madison, again in the Federalist Papers, talks about how the states will quote unquote raise various alarms and form confederations and plans when the federal government was perceived to be overreaching. And indeed, that is why he was uh, pivotal in preparing the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions uh, against the uh, government of President John Adams and its Alien, Sedition, uh, Alien and Sedition Acts, right? That was an early example of, of contestation. Um, the valence and effect of that contestation, though, has varied dramatically over time. The federal government, up until uh, the Civil War, was on the side of slavery and put down efforts by states, including Pennsylvania, uh, to uh, resist uh, the retransfer of uh, runaway slaves. There's a famous case called Prigby, Pennsylvania. Uh, after, in the second reconstruction, the federal government, I think, was on the side of what we all see as uh, the good. Today, I think that the uh, interactions between uh, national level democracy and federalism are complex and don't all run in one direction. Right. On the, on the one hand, on the one hand, uh, we we uh, I, 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 we identify a a really serious risk to democracy and the weakness of electoral administration that comes from its decentralization and from the partisan nature of its control at the level of the states. Right. So there's a dimension along which federalism can cause great harm. On the other hand, think about the recent litigation that Cyrus Vance, the DA in Manhattan, has brought. I was about to mention to, that. <laughs> yeah, with respect to uh, Mazars and other financial entities that hold Trump family records, right? Um, I, to my mind, that litigation is an important example of how states can be alternate platforms of authority and alternate sources of legality at moments in which the, the center is uh, straying from the rule of law. So I think, I think it is a mistake to think about federalism uh, in relation to the project of national democracy as having a kind of single or uh, uniform effect. I think that the effect is complex and I think we need to untangle all the different threads that make it up. Well, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I will say that, that I filed the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law with Richard Painter who was on our advisory council, filed an amicus brief in the Vance case. Um, and, you know, when you look at that case, it was just absolutely extraordinary, the arguments in the Second Circuit, where you literally had the president's lawyers and the Solicitor General of the United States defending the position that the president could literally shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and be immune to not only uh, prosecution, but even investigation. So there would be nothing that could be done. And that is extraordinary to hear, especially against the background of, you know, what used to pass as, as sort of the guardrails. But what's most important is that the Supreme Court rejected that. And it was a seven to two decision. So, you know, several conservatives, including Brett Kavanaugh, really coming in and saying, you know, guess what, the president is not above the law. Um, so doesn't that show that, uh, Tom, I'll turn to you, that federalism um, may really have some teeth in terms of um, providing guardrails on expanding executive authority, in particular presidential authority? So in this case, that happens to be right. But, you know, if you're thinking about federalism as a general matter, let's not forget that the American South was governed by an authoritarian regime for well over 100 years mm -hmm. of racial repression that was not democratic. And so, and that was, of course, facilitated by federalism. So again, it doesn't have a general effect. Um, I will say that um, it does, again, kind of cut against this very simple textualist reading of the Constitution, that the constitutional order will just be maintained by the branches uh, exercising their full powers, uh, because there is nothing, if you were to accept the president's argument, right, there would be none, and you follow the unitary executive theory, there is nothing to prevent him from going and ordering the arrest of every electoral official who, in every state that does not, uh, you know, go along with his side. 
uh, and, and um, you know, the, there's this kind of assumption that elections are just going to continue without focusing on those other elements of the definition, which we think are so critical, you know, without focusing on the rule of law as a bureaucratic matter and, you know, f open rights to associate and to um, exercise free speech. So mm -hmm. I really am fighting, I think we're really fighting against that very simplistic view that the constitution is a machine that would go of itself and doesn't require these other things. Right, so, so the last sort of guardrail, we've talked about Congress, we've talked about federalism, um, but we haven't yet talked about the courts. And, and so let's just spend a minute on that before we open up for Q&A, uh, which we're gonna do in just a minute. Um, uh, Tom, I'll stick with you again. Um, how do you see the uh, evolving role of the federal courts uh, and, um, you know, how much of a guardrail, you know, I remember back uh, when I was in law school, we were all reading uh, Alexander Bickel, The Least Dangerous Branch, and everybody was, you know, debating and talking about whether or not the courts were really, you know, the dangerous ones and, and talking about a takeover um, of the courts of, you know, by the courts of the other branches and so on. And, you know, nobody's worrying about that so much these days, but um, you know, how do you see the ability of the federal courts to serve as a counterweight? Right. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I was just looking at some data on this because I was testifying on the Hill the other day about these very issues. Uh, and one uh, important bit of data is that experts and ordinary Americans are losing faith in the ability of the courts to constrain the executive branch. It's in decline. This is a data from Bright Line Watch, which is a wonderful political science project to um, assess Americans uh, perceptions of democracy. I think that um, that's both, um, you know, not just perception, but the courts themselves, of course, have been trying to kind of stay out of these very hot button issues and uh, ducking a lot of issues. Um, and so, you know, I think certainly that's in the midterm something that's under threat. I want to wait, make one other point, though. Uh, federalism comes into play here, too, because, you know, when you think about like how the election, uh, post-election drama might play out, state Supreme Courts become very important. And I just recently read a paper which shows that state Supreme Courts have been being packed uh, by various generally Republican, I'm sorry to say, um, legislatures in recent years. No one's been paying much attention to that kind of court packing. So trying to turn the courts into a partisan weapon is obviously undermines the rule of law and more importantly, faith in the rule of law. So are you, are you concerned about the, this sort of threat to pack, pack the court? If indeed uh, the Republicans name a, if Donald Trump nominates someone, which we expect he will, uh, prior to the election and the um, Senate decides to go ahead with confirmation hearings? Well, I will say I'm concerned about the escalation. So obviously you have McConnell and Merrick Garland, you have Harry Reid before that, and it's escalating to the point where we're only going to be able to appoint judges in, in, in situations where the presidency and Senate are controlled by the same party, which means in those rare instances, you're going to have a just a raft of totally you know, young, very partisan, hardly qualified people. And I think that's a big danger. So I'm not really in favor of escalation. Uh, plus I will point out that it's not gonna be so easy to pack the courts um, because it requires getting rid of the filibuster in the Senate. And because uh, right now to pack the courts is the Judiciary Act, you have to have a majority. So what I would like to see, and Aziz and I have actually written about, is um, a bipartisan agreement on you know, actually expanding the courts uh, but to appoint judges that would be mutually agreeable. I mean, it sounds crazy, and that's what Jim Jordan called it. It sounds crazy these days. Uh, what are the chances we're going to uh, get that kind of bipartisan agreement on, on this appointment? Not very likely. The one that's coming up? Uh, no. Right. Not bloody likely. Aziz, I mentioned before uh, briefly, and so this is the, the moment to bring this in, that you had cl clerked for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And I just want to give you a moment uh, to, to say a few words about how you think she would have seen the present uh, controversy. Of course, she had as her dying wish not to be replaced until a new president was uh, sworn in. Um, how much weight should we give that? I, well, look, you know, I, I, I have a personal loyalty that's extremely strong and um, what I think is probably not what 
representative of what other people think or necessarily should be given weight because I have my own personal reasons for fidelity. Um, maybe, maybe an appeal that's more general beyond my own feelings um, would be to, the, uh, to a feature of her uh, jurisprudence that I think has been overlooked in the last week, um, which is, um, to, I think to an extent that people don't appreciate, um, Justice Ginsburg's uh, approach to the Constitution and to law was characterized by a deep commitment to democracy as a process. And um, I, I think that, that um, we have, in popular culture, come to associate constitutionalism with uh, a, an ideology, with a set of judgments about what the Constitution should be. You know, at one time, the dominant ideology was kind of left liberal. It was represented by people like Dworkin. Uh, today, it's, uh, the dominant ideology is conservative, and it is articulated in the form of originalism. But whichever uh, one of those you find attractive, both of them are anti-democratic. They're both uh, constraints upon the domain of, of uh, democratic preferences. Um, and they're, 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 uh, they find little room for the, for the, the, the judgments of people today. Um, and across Justice Ginsburg's jurisprudence, and in particular in, in cases like the Arizona Redist Independent Redistricting Commission case, um, in um, her uh, uh, writing in uh, Bush v. Gore, uh, and in other places, um, there is a deep commitment to um, a form of constitutional democracy where the accent is on democracy. And I think that the thing that would have concerned her, uh, or one of the things that would have concerned her, is just the idea that in an election, we should be looking to the courts as a way of somehow divining the popular will. How internally contradictory is that very idea? and how spectacularly dangerous is the, is the, is the claim uh, that a justice needs to be appointed so that reliable hands are at the judicial tiller on the day of the election. Yet, uh, yes, I, I can see what you're saying, though, of course, she was a champion of defending minority rights, the rights of women, reproductive rights. Uh, and so to the extent that um, there is a threat, uh, and this is uh, maybe what she perceived, which is why she did not want to be replaced until a next president came along. Um, you know, a threat to those rights and, and to everything that she had worked so hard to build up. Um, you know, she felt that- yeah, I don't think there's a contradiction there. Um, no. I think that, I think that what, I, the way that I would understand her commitment with respect to minorities, be they, well, her, respect, her, her commitment to, to, to women's rights, to gender equality, and to minority rights is she understood that there are barriers imposed by law and custom to the participation of many, many people in uh, a full range of life's activities. This is why she represented men who wanted to take care of their kids. That's true. Absolutely. Right? And um, her resistance to those uh, the carving out of our democratic, public and private lives into separate spheres to which one is assigned regardless of what one believes to be one's own vocation, is that was what she objected to. And that carving out of separate spheres and assigning of people to their little boxes, depending upon whether they're a man or a woman, that's anti-democratic too. I don't think there's any contradiction. All right, let's go to, <clears throat> excuse me, our audience questions. So we have lots of them, <clears throat> really excellent questions. So uh, the first question I have uh, is, um, was Bart Gelman's article that was posted yesterday on the Atlantic website accurate? He wrote that state legislatures have the power to appoint presidential electors regardless of the state's popular vote. Is that correct? And if so, what is the danger that a number of swing states legislatures, including Pennsylvania, 
uh, will throw their electoral votes to Trump when Biden won the popular vote in that state. So rather technical question on uh, electoral, the way the electoral college works. Uh, who wants to take that, Tom? Is that? I'll give it to Aziz, I think he's better. Aziz, all right. Well, the constitution doesn't say how uh, uh, the state uh, uh, needs to assign its uh, electoral vote, uh, its electoral college votes, right? The, the, it is the state legislature that has to do that. Um, and I think the presumption has always been that it will do that by uh, uh, following the popular vote in the, in the state. But whether and how that happens is a function of state law. So one would have to get into the intricacies of Florida or Pennsylvania law in order to understand uh, what the relative authority of the legislature or the, or the uh, governor uh, would be to, let's say, uh, uh, ignore a clear voting margin or to cut short the counting of absentee ballots before such a clear margin uh, emerged. Um, I will say that in 2000, uh, in Florida, uh, there was a movement uh, within the Florida legislature to certify a Republican slate of electors. And probably had the Supreme Court not intervened in Bush v. Gore, uh, the Florida legislature would have just certified a Republican slate, right? That, that I think is how uh, that uh, contest would have played out. Um, at least now, I think that the, the, the um, you know, the, the kind of dynamics that I, I presume Gelman is talking about, I haven't read the piece, um, are ones that would play out when, when there's palpable uncertainty over the- Right, and then that is the idea. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Tom, do you want to add to that at all? Uh, no, I think that that's, that, that, that Izzy's pretty much got that. So, so another question, um, Tom, was really for you, actually, um, that you mentioned bureaucratic rule of law as a prerequisite for democratic survival. So uh, the person who asked this question says, I have found in my limited work in other countries that rule of law has an ambiguous meaning. I recall talking to Chinese law students who asked in disbelief whether the US rule of law meant that the law binds the state as well as the citizen. An excellent question. That will never work in China, they said. Um, do you see in our jurisprudence a decline in the idea that the state and state actors are bound in the same way as the citizenry? Yes, and of course, as Claire knows, I've done a lot of work in China, and I understand uh, the thrust of the question. But I, I do think that the rule of law, ambiguous as it is, is an important ideal. We see it in jurisprudence. We saw it in the Mazars case. It was mentioned uh, the idea that the law applies to everybody, including the rulers. Uh, it's a fundamental American ideal. What we mean by the rule of law, bureaucratic rule of law, is, um, you know, as I said, most directly you need the electoral process to be governed by rules set out in advance and bureaucrats who follow it without partisan pressure or without uh, leaning towards one way or the other. You know, bureaucracy gets a terrible name. It's a, like an epithet. You know, oh, you're a bureaucrat. Uh, you know, that's, that's it's seen as being small-minded. But what we point out is that bureaucracy, more generally, is actually constitutive of democracy. Because if you don't have in a modern administrative state, you know, neutral bureaucrats who will follow the political orders, but also follow the law, um, you know, in carrying out policy, then, of course, the risk is that each side, when they come in, will, you know, try to pack the entire bureaucracy with their own supporters, uh, and that happens in many countries. Many countries, um, one of the reasons that democracy dies is because of the threat that if I lose, it's not just me losing, it's my entire, you know, clan or my whole, you know, faction. I've, there's a lot of people at state, you know, who depend on a leader and this uh, happens in a lot of places. And so the idea that you have a neutral civil service actually makes the stakes of electoral competition a little lower. And we think it's really, really important. E and, and again, a precious American value. Can I what, just add um, one? Small yeah, sure, point? please. I think, I, you know, I think what Tom's describing is also, the, you know, what, what is in the background of, uh, of the, these, these popular uh, debates or diatribes about the deep state um, in that uh, our point is that it's a mistake to assume that because a system as a whole is democratic, all of its constituent parts have to be also democratic, right? What, what we say is, no, 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 that's not right. No, if you want a democratic system, 
actually you need a bunch of non-democratic insulated elements down below. And right? what do you mean right. by non-democratic? Well, non-elected, right? Non so you, know, you want, you want yeah. non-partisan courts, you want non-partisan election administrators, you want police officers who are, who are responsive to sort of neutral, uh, again, non-partisan uh, rules, right? There's lots of elements of the state that you want to be less than perfectly responsive to partisan preferences. And one of the trickiest elements of constitutional design, if you are a committed small d Democrat, is in figuring out how you carve the joints between the bits that are responsive to the electorate and the bits that are not, right? And, and one of the, I think, the kind of rhetorical moves that the populist makes that's been very successful has been saying, no, no, look, there's all these non-democratic elements. They, they have to be the enemy. But that is a deeply uh, flawed way of thinking about democracy, although I, I, I recognize how hard it is to communicate that idea more generally. You know, one of the things that's interesting about this question um, is the fact that, that if the presidency of Donald Trump has taught us anything, uh, it's taught us how much non-legal norms have contributed to really holding uh, our traditional institutions in place. So things that we all, always took for granted about the way things were done um, are really starting to change. And, and that may not be a matter of the, uh, of, of the president or the executive branch not being held to law, but a, a measure of how little law actually has penetrated in keeping our institutions in place. Um, Tom, I don't know, do you want to uh, comment on that? Actually, you have a fair bit in the book um, of relevance to that thought. Yeah, I mean, uh, any system of law always depends on a bunch of background norms, as anyone you know, in the audience who's a lawyer knows. And so, um, you know, what happens when those norms themselves are under attack? And of course, um, this, this brings up the uh, a famous point made by uh, um, Levitsky and Ziblatt, who wrote that book, How Democracies Die. Die, right. You know, and we certainly acknowledge that, uh, that, that those norms are critical, that, they, that uh, the written text is never going to be enough and always depends on a set of uh, understandings, background understandings. And when one side uh, violates a norm, then it's a challenge and the norm can either change or has to be reinforced. And we're obviously at a critical juncture with a lot of uh, very important norms in that regard. I will All say, right. yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Tom. No, I'll stop there. I was going to go say something about forbearance, which is a separate to academic argument. Let's go on. Okay. All right. So I have a few more questions here. What happens if Trump loses and refuses to leave by declaring a national emergency uh, and the Democrats gain a majority in the Senate and retain majority in House? How would that work in removing Trump? Uh, Aziz? I, I, I think that going back to our earlier discussion of emergency powers, I, the 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 the, the emergency powers that are created by federal statute tend to be quite general, tend to be, excuse me, tend to be quite specific. The emergency, the emergency powers act provides a kind of general framework, but then it refers out to things uh, in the say public health domain and the trade domain in the immigration domain as particular emergency powers. And so it's not that there's some kind of uh, uh, brooding omnipresent emergency power in the statutory sky that Trump can draw down and, and apply. So I would, I would take out the um, emergency power as part of that uh, mm -hmm. question and, and just say, well, what happens if Trump says, I'm not gonna leave the Oval Office uh, because I think that everyone who uh, is in a blue state um, who I'm not counting for the purposes of you know, COVID, uh, uh, who voted by an absentee ballot is, was, was, was uh, committing voter fraud or something, I don't know, something about those lines, right? Um, I think by law, on the, you know, 20, whatever it is, 20, the 20th of, of, of January, he just ceases to be the president. And, and then we have- a, a And then what? But then what? Suppose well, he doesn't leave. This is what I was going to say. Then we, have a pro then we have a question of what do you- So then we have a question of law, of, of how do you induce compliance with the law, right? And we, you know, lawyers, right? We, so this is a weakness in, in the way constitutional lawyers think about things. We constitutional lawyers spend a lot of time saying this is what the rules are. 
And we don't really spend that much time in thinking about, well, how are the rules enforced, right? Ah, oh, that's the problem for the, the criminal justice people, right? Um, uh, and, you know, this is a, an issue where, or a, or a question I think that raises this, the, 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 quite sharply, the gap between, well, maybe there's a clear answer in the law, but when people refuse to do it, what do you do? Right, especially we've seen a lot of discussion about that around congressional subpoenas. We're really, it's a perfect example. We're really used to Congress and the executive branch, the president, working out these subpoenas, you know, in a reasonably collaborative way. Mm -hmm. Not always, but, but pretty much so. And, and this is the first time we've really had to confront, you know, Congress is sort of on the ropes and in trying to defend its subpoena power. And, and we see a lot of um, uh, the weakness of its position when it comes down to sort of raw power politics. Uh, though I take it that the Mazars decision did ultimately defend the right of, of Congress to have its subpoenas enforced, provided that it has uh, clearly uh, articulable reasons and, and it's within its authority. Um, but we saw this again with the McGahn case. <clears throat> um, now, <clears throat> there was a debate a couple of weeks ago uh, in the sort of um, intellectual popular press about <clears throat> whether or not the military would play a role in stepping in and removing uh, Donald Trump if he clearly lost the election and we come up to January 20th, he ceases to be the president, but he doesn't leave. Um, and an article suggested that it ought to play that, then uh, military leaders spoke out and said, actually, no, the military would not have a, a role. Um, one of the questions in the queue here asks, isn't the US military a counterweight to a full-blown attack on democracy, unlike some of the other populist autocracies that you've referred to? In our case, in other words, wouldn't the military provide that kind of counterweight? What do you think, Tom? Yeah, so um, the military is a paradigmatic, uh, what as he's referred to as a non-democratic institution, right? It's a bureaucrat, it's a bureaucracy that is uh, composed of, of professionals. Um, and what we observe around the world is that it turns out to be really critical non-democratic institution for protecting democracy. So oftentimes you'll have a populist leader who wants to call out the military, the military says no, then democracy is preserved. So um, of course our military, the president has obviously been, my view, um, been occasionally trying to politicize and you see real pushback from the senior leadership. They recognize that the wheels turn and you can't be aligned with one party or the other. And so I don't see the military playing any role whatsoever. There is of course the secret service and the president loses authority over the secret service on right. January 20th. So as right. soon as there's another president, you know, if Donald Trump, and this is not gonna happen because it wouldn't be a good TV moment for him. Um, but, you know, if he was sitting in the White House and said, I'm not leaving, well, you know, they will carry him out eventually. But that's, I don't see that happening. I think it's, uh, it's bluster. And, uh, but there would, certainly is going to be a lot of litigation, I believe, uh, and perhaps even results like Gelman is talking about uh, to try to get the Electoral College vote, which, of course, of course in December, uh, to be in Trump's favor. Well, it's very interesting because, um, of course, the, the president suggested this week that maybe he was not committed to the peaceful transfer of power. And we found yesterday Mitch McConnell speaking up to say there will be peaceful transfer of power. So this may be where the divide between the Senate majority leader and the president starts to, to show where McConnell may appear to be a little bit more of an institutionalist uh, than, uh, than Donald Trump may be. I have a uh, oh, sorry, you want to comment on that? One point about it, which is it's, um, this is why where charismatic populism comes in. The right. Populism doesn't care about parties. Right. But McConnell and the Republican leaders have to be thinking about 10, 20, 30 years from now. And what happens if you, uh, you know, align with some, uh, some, some, you know, leader who's eventually going to die one way or the other, mm -hmm. uh, and then the whole party goes down at every level. So I think the party leaders are trying to restrain him, and they've had some success in the occasions on which they've tried, which haven't been very many. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, I have an interesting historical question here, uh, going back to Weimar. Uh, uh, and the question is, um, if you really look at what happened in Weimar, in the Weimar years, the groundwork was laid down for the authoritarian, what you call a, an authoritarian collapse um, uh, earlier. 
uh, and um, the, you know, support uh, the arguments of Carl Schmitt and also an important case, the Reich against Prussia case in 1932, the year before Hitler took power, uh, in which involving um, President Hindenburg and Chancellor von Papen sending federal troops into Prussia over the objections of, of the Prussian SPD. And uh, Schmidt apparently argued uh, their case before the German uh, Supreme Court which upheld the federal military intervention. So this is a, a very interesting parallel with today's, uh, today's situation and sending federal troops into uh, Portland uh, and the, the use of troops in Lafayette Square as well. Uh, so question, uh, how do you see that uh, parallel? And uh, does it make you worry more about what the next phase would be for us? I haven't heard that parallel before, and and um, and Schmidt, I think, is a quite ambiguous uh, figure. At, I mean, at the end of the day, he's not ambiguous because he uh, formally joins uh, the Nazi Party and uh, writes in favor of the Reich. So that uh, there's nothing ambiguous about that. Yeah. But early on in his career, he 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 styles himself as a certain kind of defender of the Weimar Republic. Um, I, so when you started, Claire, your question, I thought you were that, that this was going to go in a different direction, which was uh, that one of the preconditions of the uh, the emergence of the Nazi Party, the the, uh, uh, the National Socialists, was the uh, the failure of uh, socialist left socialist parties in uh, the Weimar uh, Parliament to uh, coalesce on a practical, implementable economic program, particularly in light of the effects of the Great Depression. And uh, what stood in the way there was the belief, particularly along, among uh, the more um, hardline uh, uh, socialists and uh, slash communists, uh, that, look, we're, we're just waiting for the, uh, uh, the revolution. And, you know, we just, we, we're, uh, history has an inevitable uh, logic that Marx uh, laid out, and we don't need to do anything to, uh, for this to work out. Um, it, it, to my mind, there is the, uh, you know, the, the, the possibility that the left, um, in the face of an autocratic right of center movement, can prove its own worst enemy. It is is not an irrelevant uh, feature, or, or is not irrelevant. How, how so? How so? Um, I think I think that there is. Um, think about think about twenty sixteen rather than now. I don't want to point fingers now, but but I think in twenty sixteen the inability of the Democratic Party to coalesce and to overcome the divisions that were created by the primary process was, in retrospect, very significant. Um, and um, the belief that the, um, the, the sort of the, the, the belief that, well, there's, the, there would be no difference uh, between, uh, again, I'll, I'll use 2016, the Clinton and the Trump presidency, uh, which was, I, I at least heard it from people, um, is a serious, um, obstacle to uh, thinking effectively about preserving democratic rule as a going concern. But surely, surely when we talk about 2016, I mean, and the big thing we haven't talked about, and this is not, not square on with your book, but, but let me ask it anyway, um, you know, is the element of, of Russian intervention uh, and um, involvement in our election, um, that is, of course, something that the framers were deeply worried about, the possibility of a foreign power getting involved uh, in domestic elections uh, and the interests of one, um, one individual lining up with the interests of a foreign power. Um, so when you, and I was thinking about this with regard to your book, the factors that you analyze with regard to the erosion of democracy tend to be internal factors. Um, Tom, how do you think about 
the erosion of democracy in relation to uh, foreign interference. Right. Uh, so obviously that's a key feature of our time is that technologically electoral interference is much more uh, common. And of course, it's something that you would think that there would be bipartisan agreement on uh, trying to avoid. You would indeed, yeah. And I will say, of course, it's something that we ourselves have engaged in frequently in the last, uh, you know, certainly during the Cold War and such. And so... Um, Though not on this level. Not on, well, it's a, yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, you know, it's just not against, uh, not for other democracies, but, you know, Mossadegh in Iran, we've done, we've done, we got a pretty bad record here. But of course, you know, hate to sound like an imperialist, but we're the United States. Don't do that to us. <laughs> and so I would like to, um, you know, see, obviously, a, a lot more commitment about that. I will say that for smaller democracies around the world, the international structure can be really important. So regional organizations like the Organization of American States or the ECOWAS in West Africa have actually saved democracy on several occasions uh, and indeed pressured the coup makers in Mali last month, um, an ongoing process. And that's another example of a non-democratic institution that could save democracy. So um, I think it works both ways. We have the interference for sure, but we also have the possibility for other democracy, not our own, of, um, of, of foreign actors kind of helping out and preserving these key institutions that we're talking about. That's interesting. Okay, so a couple, a couple more for the queue before we wrap up. Uh, very interesting question about the Electoral College. Um, do you believe the Electoral College weakens American democracy? Is our current voting system aiding the slow decline of American democracy. Tom, I'll come, I'll come back to you quickly uh, and then uh, send it over to Aziz. Well, I think uh, it's, uh, first of all, as someone who spends a lot of time, uh, you know, working with people overseas, it's, it, you know, it provides me the opportunity every four years to explain uh, this, this crazy system and, um, and, and how it originated. Um, look, anytime you have a, a president who's elected with minority vote, which is what the Electoral College allows, uh, I think it's problematic from a democratic legitimacy point of view. Now, the counter argument, which is made, was made for Bush and was made for uh, Trump, is that, well, you know, but the, the strategies they use are dependent on the institutions, and so they might have gotten a majority. Uh, but I think that certainly, whatever its advantages are, and there are some in terms of making sure we don't have a regional political parties that dominate the rest of the country, um, it's clearly an inferior way of picking a leader. I'm very partial to the French system, which is a two round system yep. where you have a first round and then the last two compete against each other. So whoever wins is definitely got a majority vote and it tends to push, push candidates much more towards the center. Aziz, should we get rid of the electoral college? Uh, I, you would have no complaints on my part if that was to happen. Um, I, would, I would add to what Tom said uh, by pointing to recent experiments in uh, New England, I think New Hampshire, although I might be getting the state wrong, with uh, ranked choice voting, which is a way of achieving uh, the, the, um, the kind of majority preference rule that the two-stage uh, French uh, presidential election model has, but doing it at one shot. And... Um, my understanding, and I'm, I apologize for blanking on the particular state. Tommy Maine. nodding when I said New Hampshire, so I think it is. You know it's Maine. Is it Maine? Okay, I'm sorry, oh, Maine. Oh, interesting, okay. Um, um, uh, my, my understanding is that, is that there was not a drop off in participation in that election. And I think that there was some uh, rumors of a legal challenge, but that has, has abated. Um, so I, I, my view is that we should be, you know, it, it, Ranked choice voting is useful in the context of the presidency and for the reasons that Tom said. It, it also has enormous advantages, um, you know, in other uh, contexts. Um, you know, one of the most important being it, it, it mitigates against the risk that we now uh, see in our primary plus general system of having candidates that are always, well, asymmetrically, but generally always pulling to the extremes rather than moving to right. the Right. So, there yeah, please. On that, which is that uh, there is this very important popular movement of the popular uh, majority bypass of the Electoral College. And many states were, have committed to uh, giving all of their electoral voters to whoever wins the national majority, regardless of who wins the majority in that particular state. Uh, and if, of course, that's a way of working around it in our current constitutional system. 
All right, that's very interesting. And, and, and uh, last question is about money in politics. Um, how much does money in politics uh, interfere with our ability to maintain the, uh, the guardrails how much does it destroy our democracy? Uh, Tom, you want to start with that? Well, I have, I have no great expertise, but it's always struck me as odd to equate money with speech. Uh, obviously, that goes against a fundamental norm of equality, which we tend to think of as a key condition for democracy. Well, that's right. And, um, you know, the Citizens United uh, you know, decision gets a lot of attention, but of right. course, you know, you could overturn Citizens United, you'd still have that fundamental problem. So I don't think that, you know, focusing just on that case really resolves the issue. Um, I've seen some reports that that dark money actually isn't very large, uh, but we're going to have roughly $6 billion to spend in this presidential election uh, cycle. And so, you know, money, money matters. And I think uh, there many democracies have confronted this and solved it. And so it's not like we could well, and, and of course, talking about uh, foreign interference, one of the things that, uh, unfortunately, the, the Mueller investigation did not address, but could have, uh, but it wasn't within, within Mueller's mandate, is the role of uh, Russian money. And you mentioned in the book um, uh, Marine Le Pen in France, and we, we do have strong evidence that the Russians pump quite a bit of money into the extremes uh, in in the French situation, uh, as well as elsewhere. So, I mean, that's really a chapter that needs to be told in conjunction with foreign interference, I think. Aziz, you want to add to that? I think that the um, focus should not be per se on money and politics, but upon what uh, authors like Larry Bartels have pointed out, which is that um, politicians well before, national politicians well before Citizens United, were far more responsive to the preferences of the top decile uh, by wealth of the American population than anyone else. So we have a policy that, that above and beyond our campaign finance system is extremely responsive to a very narrow class of people. And um, one of the, uh, surely not the only reason, and maybe not the most important reason, but one of the uh, streams that is flowing into our particular uh, moment of democratic peril is the fact that there are so many people who feel that the political system does not respond to them and, and they are not wrong. Um, and so the way that I would think about it is that um, money in politics is a problem when, we, when it causes a system that is unresponsive to the preferences of many and where in particular the economic plight of many is roundly ignored. Um, to my mind, and I'll close with this point, one of the really important events of the last uh, decade politically, um, and I'm drawing this from Adam Tooze's book, uh, uh, Crash, uh, was the decision of the Obama administration to um, support the financial industry but not to support uh, individuals whose mortgages were underwater in the wake of the 2009 crisis. Um, I think that that's representative of, the, 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 of, a, of a problem. And I'm deliberately picking a democratic example. Um, and is the kind of policy choice, um, a policy choice, by the way, that we see replicated with respect to the present pandemic, um, that leaves people quite reasonably really angry at their political system. Um, I'm going to fit in one more very quick question for each of you, but you only get to choose one, one answer, brief answer. If you could enact one reform in our system to protect our democracy, uh, what would it be, Tom? Nonpartisan commissions and electoral administration at the state level no secretaries of state running in offices for the votes for of which they're counting. Aziz? That would be mine, but um, uh, uh, I would make the Department of Justice an independent agency. Interesting. Let's say one more thing about that. Uh, that means that it wouldn't be responsive to uh, the president. Mm. Uh, you know, get, make it like the Federal Reserve. Recognize right. that uh, the rule of law is just like the probity of the dollar. It's a public good that shouldn't be 
uh, 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 traded upon for partisan reasons. And of course, uh, you know, when we think about our electoral system as really our critical infrastructure, which is something that we are only start starting to understand what that could mean and how to protect it, um, your suggestion, I think, uh, would come in very, very well uh, to, to, to help protect our national security and, and protect our democracy. I'd really like to thank both of you. Uh, Tom, Aziz, this has been a fascinating discussion. The book is an absolutely wonderful read and of course so critical to everything that's going on right now in our politics and our democracy. There it is, uh, it everybody. And uh, I am, of course, so sorry that we cannot host you in person. I very much hope that when <laughs> if we can imagine a time we are past this pandemic, uh, you will come in and spend a little time with us so we can properly uh, take you out to dinner and, and, and get a few uh, in-person photos and, and, and just continue the conversation because this has really been so interesting. And we'd like to uh, see more of you in the future. Thank you again. Thank you everyone in our audience for joining us. Uh, we will be having more book talks throughout the year and we hope you'll join us for those as well as send us your, your feedback, your comments, uh, and please stay involved with the Center for Ethics and the Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.